Peace and Hotep family, House of Consciousness brings to you Brother Umar Johnson. He's dealing with post-traumatic slavery disorder. Alright, this is like part three of what he had done, but the brother is on point. This is a dynamic lecture here in Harlem with the House of Consciousness, Brother Sonetta. So I want you to sit back, relax, and enjoy this powerful conscious information. Black power, family. words before we get right into the body of my man lecture, Brother Natural Tahuti. Give it up for Natural Tahuti. This black man right here, he got a lot of heart. He's the brother that took on Dr. Wesley Muhammad in a, in a um, live debate where he was banging hard on the Nation of Islam. Now we know back in the days in the 60s, you can't say one word against the Nation of Islam, right or wrong. Or where would they find you? In the alley somewhere. But this black man right here was banging hard on Dr. Wesley Muhammad, and now they are more closer than ever. You see that? So it didn't break them come apart. They became brothers after that debate. Brother Natsu Tahu. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Peace and blessings, whole chapter of black power. First, in African tradition, I'm going to ask my elders, am I allowed to speak? Can I speak? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I know that's right. I had that debate with Wesley Muhammad. It was uh, uh, it was a wonderful thing because both of us disagreed with a topic, but at the end of it, we was able to unify. And since that time, I've been in the spirit of trying to unify. You know, let's forget our philosophical differences and our theological differences. The time that we're living in now calls for black unity. But one of the, the, the topics I've been um, I'm on the battlefield again, excuse me. I'm on the battlefield again. <laughs> That's right. And I am taking a lot of flack. You know, I got a brave heart. They call me Tahuti the Lionheart. This topic that I'm talking about today has to do with the divinity of the black woman. There's a lot of testosterone in the conscious community with us men. But where does the woman fit? Is the woman secondary <coughs> but most necessary? That's the way we've been taught. Well, prior to this all-male patriotic system in very remote ancient times, before, in Africa, before there ever was a male god, there was a female god. That was known all over the planet. There was never a mistake about it. There was no mistake about the female's divinity. We never called Father God, we always called on Mama God. Father God, this all Father God male concept is actually a Eurocentric concept. Because the European was the one that brought the hatred for the woman on this planet. I know you're all familiar with the stories of cavemen, well, well white folks came out of caves. They were living in the caves of Europe, and the white man did not know how to love. He didn't know how to love his woman. He raped her, he beat her, and matter of fact, she had to sleep with everybody in the cave. The father, the son, the brother, the uncle, the grandfather, and she had no recourse. She had no defense. You see, because if she got tired of it, you know, the only choice she had to do was leave the cave. But by the time she got to the entrance of the cave, now remember, they're in the ice age, she would hear that. And so she could not go out into that cold, icy climate and defend herself without the men. So she had no other choice but to be under the foot of the white man. But now, on the other side of the planet, the black woman, she enjoyed a free reign of leadership. Africans for thousands of years acknowledged the universe. And when they looked into the universe, from their observations, they observed that the darkness of night or the sky was pregnant with life. And so they began to design their deities 
in reverence to what they had observed from the stars. This is star sign. When we deal with religion, understand that religion comes from the African concept of star science. And that star science was that the universe was pregnant. And so that that dark matter represented the feminine principle. And not only in the cosmos, the macrocosm, even in the microcosm, the woman was uh, uh, held in such esteem. We don't have that esteem today. And I'm telling you, us men will have, us men in the conscious community too, we are going to have to live with the fact that the black woman is God. You are produced from your mother. And it is through that mother's love that we got to, we have to resurrect that energy. And the women, the women are going to have to resurrect that goddess in them and stand up. Black women must also be on the front line. Your job is not only in the kitchen. I'm not saying you got to come out here and kick butt like we do, but imagine women getting up on these stages, on these platforms, out in our neighborhoods, going to teach our children. You know women can attract more people to this conscious community than us men could ever do. I'm going to tell you right now, all you men know this. You might know me your whole life, but you'll never let me in your apartment. See one of them fine women out there. You let her in your apartment in a minute. In a minute. And y'all know that to be true. You don't even know her. You know me all your life. And I'll never get to see the inside of your apartment. But a woman, she could be a stranger. You'll let her in there. And so what I'm saying in closing is that um, we have to give reverence to the great mother principle. We must return to the African mother principle of male and female equality. And lastly, I will be doing a lecture sometime in December, probably at the Harriet Tubman School, where I'm gonna be dealing with, I'm gonna bring you empirical data, empirical evidence of the great black mother. I'm gonna even also be talking about a science called Parthenogenesis, that the first the sons on this planet came from a process of the divine birth, the virgin birth. Not through a spooky science, but through a, a scientific science called Parthenogenesis. The first male children on this planet came through a process called Parthenogenesis. And it will still even be happening to this day once we learn how to regenerate when the women learn how to regenerate their bodies and stop the debilitating process of the men's, where she is losing all of her life substances, we will begin to give birth to divine children once again. And so with that, I thank you very much, and black power. Yeah, let's give it up for Nancy Tahuti, fam. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, are y'all ready, brothers and sisters? I'm going to bring to the stage a powerful warrior. How many of you ever heard of Abdullah Johnson? Yeah. Yeah. How many of you? Raise your hand if you heard of him, brother. Raise your hand if you've seen him on video. How many of you heard him on the radio? Well, this brother right here has dedicated his life to bring forth some knowledge and information as well as inspiration to our youth that's out there. Let's give it up for brother Abdullah Johnson, family. Uh, hit the lights, brother. You want to try that? Just take a pause for Black a minute. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Race first. Race first. Race first. Race first. All right. The Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey used to say that the most powerful defensive weapon within the race of African people was to practice race first in all parts of the world. He said if we just looked out for ourselves first instead of looking out for everybody else, we could solve half our problems overnight. He also said that if the Negro is not careful, he will drink in all the poisons of Western civilization yes. and die from the effects of it. That's right. Okay. I want to thank you all for coming out today, especially given the scare of the weather. I thank the Supreme Ruler of the Universe for holding back the rain so folks can come on out. So that was definitely a blessing. It's my first time 
presenting in New York City. Hopefully it's not my last. And uh, I come before you today to share some information with you. Not to offend, but to make you think the greatest weapon used against black people is misinformation. That's right. Not guns, not bombs, not even police brutality is a greater threat than misinformation. Okay, so today I just want to give you some accurate information. My goal is for you to walk out of here a little bit more enlightened than when you came in. And I know you came in very, very enlightened because we're all very educated in this room. But I want to give you some things to think about. Okay, so that's what we're going to deal with today. When you talk about post-traumatic slavery disorder, a lot of people look at it as a sensationalized topic to justify why black folks are not taking care of their business. But as a psychologist, I can tell you that post-traumatic slavery disorder is nothing more than an extensive form of post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay? Now, there is a such thing as post-traumatic stress disorder. When brothers come back from the Gulf War in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they're waking up in the middle of the night attacking a queen, thinking she's the enemy in the dream, that's post-traumatic stress disorder. When a brother gets married to a sister, okay? and they go to make love that first night of the wedding day if he hadn't been with her prior to that and she rejects him unconsciously she doesn't know why it's because she's having a recollection of molestation or rape that took place when she was a child post-traumatic stress disorder so black people every time they wake up and they're ready to do something to improve the situation they automatically have something inside of them that tells them don't do it there's a fear that kicks in, an unconscious fear that prevents us from doing what we have to do. That's post-traumatic stress disorder. Slavery disorder kicking in. So does it exist? Of course it exists. Why don't Europeans acknowledge it? Because if you're going to acknowledge responsibility for creating a mental disorder in a group of people, then it automatically lays the grounds for what? Reparations. And one of the arguments that I've been making to our brothers and sisters in a reparation struggle is that you have failed to compute mental damage in the reparations amount of money. Y'all follow me? Yes. They're talking about the labor. That's one thing. That's only one piece. What about the mental damage of slavery? Why haven't we computed that yet? Don't leave out the mental. Because for those of you who haven't been to court, you know that them lawyers can get a whole lot of money off the pain and suffering. And we've been through more pain and suffering than anybody else. So I just want to make sure you understand crystal clear that most of our behavior, without a doubt, comes out of the consequence of slavery. It doesn't matter that you were not a slave. And this is where we get hung up. Well, I was not a slave, okay? But you also didn't come out your mother a drunk. That's but right. so how did you learn the behavior of alcoholism? That's right. Because it was shown to you by your elders, the living elders. Uh. You understand? Poverty, you're not born into poverty. But if you're born into the poverty mindset and it's never eradicated outside of you, then you will also grow to live in poverty. My point is mental states are passed down by conditioning and direct teaching of the community and the parents. It doesn't matter if you didn't experience it. If this brother suffers a trauma, God forbid, and I live with that brother, I can be traumatized vicariously just by knowing what he went through. Vicarious trauma. Talk to a woman whose husband suffers from Gulf War Syndrome. She has been traumatized and she wasn't even there vicariously. My point is that black people teach their children to fear white people without even knowing it. That's right. Mm. We teach our children to fear white people without even knowing it. That's right. Okay? So post-traumatic slavery disorder is passed down through behavior, through role modeling, but it's also in your genes. We have to understand those two strands of DNA does not just dictate what color your eyes are going to be, how tall you're going to be, how much you weigh. You also carry within you the stress, the pain, the failures, and the successes of your ancestors. That emotional energy is within all of us. And it comes out at different times and in different ways, but we got to understand that that everybody in your bloodline who came before you is still with you right here and right now. That's right. In your DNA. That's right. So we want to be clear about that. Now, if we want to talk about black people becoming whole again, we got to talk about spirituality. And one thing we got to understand is that black people are spiritual people. Psychology 
is not the study of the spirit. Psychology is the study of the mind. Sigmund Freud stole psychology out of Africa. So did Carl Jung. Do the research, both of them spent expensive years of their professional life studying the mysteries of Kemet. And they wrote about it. In fact, if you ever see a picture of Sigmund Freud's office, you would think that you were in the office of Naim Akbar or Wade Nobles or Cress Wilson. He had the statues of all the Egyptian divinities in his office. What would an Austrian Jew be doing with a complete collection of Egyptian divinities? Studying the spiritual system of Africa. Brought it back to Europe and he called it what? The philosophy of the unconscious. The philosophy of the unconscious is nothing but the metal nature of Egypt. That's all it is. The difference was they translated the word psyche into mind because the European is very materialist. And we have to make sure we don't become materialist. That's right. Make sure we don't become materialist. For the European, if he can't see it, touch it, taste it, or smell it, it don't exist. So spirit is outside of his realm of science because it's unmeasurable. Because the European has a God complex. If he can't fathom it, if he can't grasp it, it must not be real. His arrogance leads him to conclude that since this is outside my ability to understand, it must not exist. We are not that people. Psychology for us is study of the spirit. And that's why when black people go and get psychotherapy, a lot of them never get healed because the therapist, who's either European or trained by Europeans, doesn't deal with their soul. You got to deal with the soul of a black person. You are God's first people. And as God's first people, you are the only people on the face of the earth who can literally say that I descend from no other type of people. I come directly from God. And that's why I never get into arguments about who's God's chosen people because the only thing that matters to me is who is God's first people. That can be proven beyond the shadow of a doubt. Now, whenever I talk about religion or spirituality, Right, yeah, turn that down. Oh, bring the mics down. I'm sorry, good people. I heard one of the babies say Jesus. <laughs> now, this picture right here is the number one selling Jesus in the black community. Okay, some of you still got it at home right now. Don't lie about it. And some of us make excuses for why I still hang it up. This has been a keepsake in my family for 20 generations. This has been a keepsake in my family for 15 generations. My grandmom got that from her grandma, who got it from her grandma, who got it from her grandma, who got it from her slave master. That's right. Okay? That's right. Now, I want to make this crystal clear. And we're not talking about religion, we're talking about the imagery that we use within the religions. Understand what the word symbol means. A symbol is an object that infers more than what it appears to on the surface. Let me say it again. A symbol is an object that infers more than what it appears to on the surface. So if we use the definition of a symbol and apply it to that picture, what is being inferred? Not just that Jesus was white, but that the God is a white man. And if the white man is God, it automatically brings the conclusion that the black man is the devil. Uh. So we have to be crystal clear that when we teach our young people, that whenever you raise up the European, who is the total opposite of the African, you are automatically denigrating yourself. Yes, See, when a black child is raised believing this to be the savior, then the brain automatically associates that image with the image of every other white man that child ever sees. And so all white men become the savior. That's right. And if the white man can be the savior of the boy, then why can't an adult white man be his homosexual savior as well? Woo! Right. t -talk. The brain is an associating organism. It learns in pictures. Right. Everything you know right now is stored as a symbol in your mind. And one of the geniuses of African people, particularly in Kemet and other civilizations on the Nile Valley, is that they created languages and pictures. People always ask the question, why did they go through all of the hard work to create a language and pictures? 
Why didn't they just do what the Chinese did or the Japanese did and just come up with simple characters brought out by, by simple geometric lines? Dash, dash, straight line. Why did they create a picture? He could have just wrote a word. Why a whole picture? Because your ancestors knew that your brain stores information in pictures. So they gave you the language in pictures so you would have no trouble committing it to memory. It took European psychology almost 200 years to catch up to that. That's why it's in pictures, because somehow the ancients knew that everything that goes in here is stored as a picture. And one thing you got to understand about the unconscious, the realm of the spirit, is that whatever it is given, it will automatically take and draw its own conclusion if you don't do it for it. So if a child is constantly being inundated with images of a white Jesus, the unconscious will naturally associate that white Jesus to George Bush, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, and every other white man they run into. We're going to talk about him in a minute. See, these pictures are very, very dangerous to the psyche. And see, some of us have this belief that as long as I know Jesus wasn't white, it don't matter. That's the biggest lie ever told. Your conscious mind is not more powerful than your unconscious mind. So if you are feeding your unconscious mind images of a white savior, no matter what your conscious mind thinks, you will act based on what is in the reservoir of the unconscious. And that's why we have to be careful about what we watch, what we read, what we listen to, even as adults. Because you do not have the power. You do not have the power to keep the unconscious from eating all that nasty garbage that we feed the mind. I had a conversation with a sister in Philadelphia the other day. She said she was a vegetarian. I said, I don't have a problem with that. But my point is, what is your thought diet looking like these days? What is the information diet? Because the fact that you don't eat meat, but you're running around with a European consciousness, hell, you dead anyway. You know where you want me to go, I, I skip it. Just say go. Right. Now, because paintings wasn't good enough, they gave you a living image. Y'all remember this movie, this is one of the best sellers. And most of y'all still got the tape. Okay, <laughs> a white Jesus. And then, flip to that next one, Sarnetta. This was ridiculous because this is, what's his name? Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson. When this movie came out, every black mega church in America rented like five tour buses to go and take their whole church. Y'all remember because it was all over the front page. Black people spent more money to go and see Passion of the Christ than any other movie ever made. Mm, mm, mm. Okay? Same. And to find out that the creator of the movie was a racist is no shock to you and I, but what about all those Negroes who made that man wealthy off of that white Jesus? And see, it's real easy to tell a Negro. You can always detect a Negro because for a Negro, color don't matter. That's right. That's if the Negro say. is the only population on the face of the earth to whom color don't matter. Well, if color don't matter, why did the European go out of his way through a process of more than 500 years to change every black Madonna and child of Jesus the Christ and his mother Mary in painting and in statue from an African to a European? If it did not matter. Furthermore, if it did not matter, why aren't the black churches today making Jesus to look like he originally looked back in Africa? It's because we have that post-traumatic slavery disorder going on. Which means that if a lot of black people went to church on Sunday and Jesus looked like you or me, many of them would never come back the following week. That's right. Because we fail to realize that in the black community, we still have color consciousness, i.e. light skin supremacy. Uh, uh, uh. And that's the reason why Barack Obama, who's done nothing for black people, can still be worshipped like a god by black people. But Clarence Thomas, who's also done nothing for black people, will be denigrated. What is the difference between Obama and Clarence Thomas in terms of policy for black people? Nothing. But because Clarence Thomas is jet black with big lips and a broad nose Woo! and a nappy hair, it is natural for you to deride him. But Obama is light skinned with good curly hair. So you can't <laughs> attack him. 
That's right. And if you don't believe me, look at black leadership in America. Ever since the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey and Khalid Muhammad would get our honorable mention, you have never had a black leader who did not pass the paper bag test. Because you would not follow a black skin leader. Mm. If Jesus came in this room right here, not with you, but if Jesus came in a black community, many of us would reject him just based on light skin supremacy. See, there's white supremacy, there's light skin supremacy, and then there's homosexual supremacy. Now, homosexual supremacy is what the black community is evolving to now. That's right. Homosexual supremacy T. is the order of President Obama. Every president in U.S. history is given two directives, one international, one domestic. President Obama's international agenda is to subdue and recolonize Africa, and he's doing it through AFRICOM. His domestic agenda is to make sure that homosexuality becomes the rule of law in the black community. And we're going to get to homosexuality in a minute, but I don't want you to look at it purely as a cultural perversion. Homosexuality is a form of population control in the black community. Next slide. If they can convince an entire generation of black children to have sex with people of the same gender, then they reduce the black birth rate, cut it in half. It's all about eugenics. Now what's the difference between spirituality and religion? Number one, religion is about blind faith. Spirituality is about inquiry. Religion has nothing to do with science. Spirituality is a science. Like the brother said, star science. Religion is about damnation, but spirituality is about balance, ma'at, karma. Religion says there's one God. Spirituality said that we are one with God. And we have to evolve our consciousness back into who we were, which were a people who were one with God. The word ak ra ka from God's soul. God in heaven versus God in me. Doctrine versus divinity. One way versus multiple paths. Eternal sin versus enlightenment. There's no doctrine of eternal sin in Africa. You can't find it nowhere. That's right. Nobody's born in sin. Nobody was born in sin until they was born in slavery. Mm. My point is that there's nothing wrong, in my opinion, for you to have whatever religion you choose. That ain't my issue. It's how you use it that's my issue. See, every tool is neutral. It's how it gets applied. And the problem is we got just as much religious gangbanging in the black community as we got ghetto gangbanging, and we also got revolutionary gangbanging. Right. See, there can be no unity whenever there is the rule of ego. Mm. There can be no unity whenever there is the rule of ego because unity is about blending spirits into oneness. Ego is about having one person in control. That's right. Mm. One is European, one is totally African. You cannot beat white supremacy using his own techniques. That is not your nature, that is not your origin, that is not your history. And some of us think that we have to become European to beat the European. And we wonder why we can't win because we're fighting the enemy on the outside, but we did nothing about the white man that's living inside of every black man or the white woman that's living inside of every black woman. See, remember now, your environment is your looking glass. There can't be poverty outside unless there's poverty in the inside. There can't be white supremacy on the outside unless there's white supremacy on the inside. Your inner spirit in nature and world is congruent with the outer. So what black people have to do is look honestly at ourselves and say, well, why haven't we made more progress? It's because the war is totally external. We must also wage a spiritual warfare on the inside. Right. Because you can kill every European on the face of the earth, but guess what? You're going to replace them with black-skinned Europeans who will be even worse than they are if we will have a psychological revolution. Right. Next slide. Narrow-mindedness versus open-mindedness. I'm right and everybody else is wrong. That's one of the biggest European concepts we have picked up in the West. If you're not a Muslim, you're going to hell. If you're not Christian, you're going to hell. If you're not Hebrew, you're going to hell. If you're not Yoruba, you Whoa! That ain't African. So where did we get that total totalitarian religious from? We got it from the colonizer. 
Because when the Arab came into East Africa, he said, this is the only religion, and anyone who doesn't follow it will be executed. The European said, this is the only Bible, and anyone who doesn't accept it will be executed. So not only did we pick up, it's not that you necessarily picked up the religion from the colonizer, but you picked up his interpretation of it. That's right. Ooh, ooh. There you go. So you go around the black community trying to colonize everybody else, just like the Arab and the white man did you. And you don't even realize what you're doing. You see that? You discover the spirit by going within and everybody's spiritual path is a little bit different and I don't have to believe in your religious story in order to have a relationship with God. The problem is we put stories between people and God. If you want God, but first you gotta accept the story of Muhammad. You gotta accept the story of Moses. You gotta accept the story of Noah. No religious fable ain't got a damn thing to do with your relationship with your creator. Because you had that before you even came to the mother's womb. That's right. And can't nobody take it from you except the Creator. It's not that you're not with God. You are with God automatically because you are one of the netters sticking out from the sun just like everything else living is. You just have to rediscover that. So we have to stop making people think that we are somehow off the path of divinity if we don't accept somebody's story. Next slide. Now, we got to talk about black male-female relationships. Ooh. Bad situation going on. One day I hope to come back, I have a whole presentation called for sisters only relationships and dating that I want to do only with the sisters. Mm. All right, but in the meantime, let's just touch on a couple things. Number one, black people are marrying for the wrong reasons. And one of the reasons we're married is because we love somebody. Love is an emotion. It waxes and wanes and it wavers. You don't make any decision off of an emotion. You don't make a decision to relocate off an emotion. You don't make a decision to have kids off an emotion. You don't make a decision to go to war off of emotion. These are intellectually rationalized decisions that are made with a calm mind. But we have brought into the European cultural concept of marriage out of love. So your daughter comes home, she's in love, but he can't do nothing for her. Your son comes home, he's in love, but she can't do nothing for him. Why did you marry this person? Because I loved him. Is that all? And the reason why arranged marriages last longer than marriages that are based on love is because they are based on concrete factors. Your decision to get married should be based on a commitment to the culture to procreate and bring up strong warrior Africans who can continue to struggle. That's why you get married. It is a pact with the race. It has more to do with us as a people than it does with the person you settle in down with. But we don't have that. Our concept of marriage is totally ind individualized and independent. Marrying for love. And the thing about it is in, inside of us, spiritually, many of us have psychological imbalances that come from our family of origin. So when we think we're in love with somebody, we're not even in love, we're only in ego attachment with somebody else. And ego attachment and love are two totally different things. And most of the time we don't even realize it was ego attachment until the person we claim we love so much does something we don't like and now we become enemies in five minutes. <laughs> wow. Wow. Next slide. Marrying for the ego, financial security, status, all that's important, okay? But it shouldn't be a priority. Money don't make nobody happy. The problem is the only people who know that are the people who are rich. The people who ain't rich think that they a little bit more and I'll feel better. A little bit more and I'll feel better. A little bit more and I'll feel better. And you get a little bit more and you're still not happy. Doctors, lawyers, and rich people in Hollywood are at the top of the list for therapeutic referrals. <laughs> because the lifestyle they live isn't really healthy or normal. Next slide. Difference of value. It's not similar, it's not how similar you are, but whether you share the same priorities. It's all about values. You ain't got to be the same as your mate, but y'all gotta have the same values. What do I mean by that? If she values running the streets and you value spending time with the children, it ain't gonna work. If you value God and they value money, it ain't gonna work. 
If you value your parents and they can't stand theirs, it ain't gonna work. And black woman, please listen to me when I tell you, if he don't respect his mother, there's no way in hell he's gonna respect you. A man's relationship with his mother is the prototype, blueprint relationship with every woman he's going to date for the rest of his life. There's no way he can have a healthy relationship with you because you are a what? A symbol of mama. And it's the same thing with the men. If your queen don't respect her father, what are you doing? I'm not saying you can't date, but you better find you a truly African-centered therapeutic and spiritual practitioner so they can work on that union because you are a symbol. And without her even knowing, she will denigrate and mistreat you because you are nothing but the father. And because my dad was an SHIT, neither are you. Woo! See? And that's why in Africa, the marriage was between two families, not two people. That's right. Because wow. mom right. had to check out his mom. And dad had to check out her dad. That's right. But we don't do that no more. This is my business. But soon when you get divorced, now all of a sudden you're running back to mom and dad. I thought it was your business. Why are you bringing it to me now? So we got to teach our children how you properly select a mate and it's not based on love and it's not based on lust. And because too many of our marriages are based on love and lust, they do not last because those are fleeting emotions. Next slide. Unmet psychological needs, absentee mothers, absentee fathers, history of abuse, history of rejection. Black woman, listen to me clearly. If you keep on attracting the same type of man, year in and year out, you keep getting the same type of man, it's because you have an unmet psychological need from childhood that has not been taken care of, and so that vulnerability is magnetizing exactly what you don't need because you think it's really what you do need. Woo. Stop looking at the man and say, what is wrong with me? If you are a woman who never got the love of dad, you're more likely to put up with somebody because you're not used to having it. If you're somebody who got a low self-esteem, you can be easily manipulated by somebody who tells you good things about yourself. Look at your vulnerability. If you write down the names of everybody you've ever dated, whether you're a man or a woman, you will see something in common with all of them that will point you to your own psychological crutch. And one of the biggest problems with relationships is that most of us don't have the discipline to be by ourselves long enough to heal before we get into another relationship, especially the women. You can't go from a relationship with Raheem today and you with Tony tomorrow. Every time you get intimate with somebody, your spirits are exchanging with one another. So if Raheem's energy is in your womb, and now you're putting Rob's energy in your womb, and now you're putting the next brother's energy in your womb, first child you have going to come out like a black Fred Krueger. <laughs> and that's why some of our children are born with the stress. They come out with it. Nearly every young man I work with who got some sort of emotional imbalance, when I trace it back, either the mother didn't know who the father really was or the father put the mother through a whole bunch of stress. It is in the child's DNA. There's nothing you can do about it. Until you can be happy with yourself, you can't be happy with nobody else. And the problem we make is we keep on getting married so somebody can make us happy. Marriage is work. Sometimes it can be very unhappy. That's right. Which is why you gotta have a reason for being married other than being happy. It is a business arrangement. Business arrangement. I wrote an article last week, if you go to blacknews.com, you'll read it, and it's called The Black Man's Attraction to White Women. Love, Lust, or Legacy of Self-Hatred. We have to understand that the more the black man gets educated, the more he moves up in social standing, the better job he gets, the more rejected he feels by white society. Uh -huh. And as a result of that, y'all follow me? As he goes up, the rejection gets stronger. So he gets to a point where he says, damn, I got all the degrees, I got the money, I got the income, but I'm still feeling inferior, and I'm still being rejected by the dominant white society, so how do I deal with this? The only way I can fill one with the society that does not want me is to bring a symbol of it home with me. And so the white woman symbolizes the black man's desire to be accepted by people who will never have him.
And sisters, don't get mad with him because a black man who marries a white woman ain't a man you needed to be with in the first place. I got an email today on my way to New York City. Sister read my article online, she said, thank you very much. She said, I was married to a black man and he got three children by three different white women. He cheated on me and got these white women pregnant. And, he, and she said that my daughter is chocolate, black, and beautiful. His other children are Obama babies, biracial. And she said that he breaks his neck to spend time with the biracial babies and totally rejects his own light skin supremacy. See, we got to understand, if I go and get a white woman and have a child with that white woman, why am I having a child with that white woman? It's because I no longer desire to see anything that looks the hell like me. And so when that baby comes out, he's biracial. And so now I feel better because my son is nothing but a mirror reflection of me. But instead of looking at black skin, nappy hair, and big lips, I now see European features. You see that? It is a form of genetic extermination. Self-inflicted genocide is what interracial marriage is. Wow. And the reason we have to be so careful about it is because when you study the fall of African empires, I don't care if it was in the Caribbean, South America, Africa, or Asia, you will see that whenever the European came in, he did not defeat us with European arms. He defeated us with mulatto arms. It was the children of the invader who they used to fight against their own African brethren. And right now in Africa, it's repeating itself. But instead of it being the white man, it is the Oriental. In Nigeria, the Koreans are marrying African women, having half Asiatic, half black kids who they are going to use to oppress us. And the reason why they married a black woman is because if the child is half black, he's now open to all of the benefits of being a natural citizen by birth. And they're going to use those biracial children to oppress their own brothers and sisters. It's the same thing the United States government is doing right now with the so-called Hispanic. The Hispanic is an African. In fact, when you study the Marcus Garvey movement, you will see that the Garvey organization had more chapters in Cuba and Puerto Rico than most other places on earth. Yes, the red, black, and green flag was in Puerto Rico and Cuba more than most other islands and nations. But in 1970, something happened. And the United States government created something called a Hispanic. Right. In the 1970 census, if you don't believe me, do your own work. And so for the first time, if you were a Negro, which is what we would call back then, if you were a Negro who spoke Spanish and didn't want to be black, we got a new label for you. Wow. Let's fast forward to the year 2010, the census that just took place. What did you see on there? Biracial. Now let me ask you something. In slavery, when black women were raped, when a child came out, did they call him biracial? Nope. He was an in like everybody else. Right. So how is it 143 years later, the product of a black-white intermixture is now biracial? Because they are using the old strategy of divide and conquer, separate and rule to destroy the race. And we fall for it. And we fall Labels. Cablin Nation. What the hell is that? Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods. <laughs> Caucasian, black, Asian, Native American. Nigga, you crazy. <laughs> you understand? And when he got into the courtroom, did the judge call him Cavalier Nation? No. no. Uh uh. Gave that woman the largest divorce settlement of a superstar in history, except for maybe for uh, uh, Donald Trump. Married that woman. She was a, a nun or, or a nanny in somebody's house. You didn't even know her. Damn. Bro. Say that again. Bro, bro, bro. Oh, yes, oh, and, and, and let's be honest. I studied this. I did a paper in undergrad on interracial relationships. 98% of black men, excuse me, 98% of all interracial relationships are black men and white women. And of those, normally the white woman is broke and the black man is rich. She only marries a Negro if there's something to be gained from the union. Why can't they see that? Do you really think she would be married to Kobe Bryant? Do you really think James Earl Jones would be with her? Do you really think Sidney Poitier, Tim Duncan? Do you really think Cuba Gooden Jr.? Hell no. 
But because you want to be white so damn bad, and since I want to be rich so damn bad, I think we can make this work. Do y'all follow me? 1967, the United States Supreme Court struck down anti-miscegenation laws. A white man by the name of Loving in the state of Virginia sued all the way up to the Supreme Court for the right to marry a black woman. When the Supreme Court struck down that law, black men went running looking for white women. And since then, we have married out of our race. Listen to me clear, because I want you to get this right. Black men have married out their race more than the men of every other race in America put together. Wow. Yeah. And if it's about love, if it is about love, why can't we find one rich white woman married to a broke brother? Oh, teach, brother. Teach, brother. Next slide, son. To avoid the pain of loneliness. Many of us get involved in relationships not because of love, but because we don't love ourselves. The person we're dating is a distraction to keep us from dealing with our own dirty closets. Do you understand? It's just like an alcoholic or a crack fiend. They use the drug to keep from dealing with what? Reality. You go from relationship to relationship, a pathological monogamous. Why? So you don't have to deal with your own laundry. The problem is in that relationship, the laundry is going to get exposed anyway because what we still got to realize is two sick-ass Negroes cannot make a happy family. If she's depressed and I'm anxious, she's borderline and I'm bipolar, I was molested, she was raped, what the hell are kids going to be like? See? See? So we got to deal with this, good people, because it ain't making no sense. And black women, and we ain't going to discuss this here, but something y'all got to deal with. I'm not saying you got to accept polygamy, but I'm saying you got to regulate it because it's taking place. And the fact that it's not being regulated is due to a whole bunch of out of wedlock births and a whole bunch of undercover, illegitimate situations, if y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm not saying you got to accept it, but you got to deal with the fundamental question. Given the situation of black men in America, the jails, the drugs, police brutality, homosexuality, and everything else, what are you going to do for those other 10 sisters who want a mate and want a baby and it ain't enough to go around. Mm. I'm just saying think about it, Queen, because polygamy ain't about the men. It's really about the women. It is the women who's sharing your husbands, even though they know that's your husband, because they have a God-given right to have a husband and they have a God-given right to have children. And if there's not enough black men to go around, what are we going to do about it? We can't keep on saying, I got mine. I don't know. She better find her own, because she's going to find yours. Mm. So I'm just saying it's something we got to deal with. I'm not saying that we should run out there and practice it right now because it ain't going to work. You want to know why? I belong to the Islamic community in Philadelphia. If you want to see polygamy going bad, just look at it in the African-American Islamic community. And I'm saying it and you can quote me. You got serial polygamy going on. Married a sister, she pregnant, you divorced her two weeks later, you all pregnant somebody else. Y'all follow me? And the imams ain't saying nothing about it. And I'm not saying this is going on at all the African-American Islamic communities, but some of them in Philadelphia and other places, you even see it here in New York, it's the issue. Sisters are being victimized and exploited and being taken advantage of in the name of religion. Woo! So we got to deal with it. Next slide. Now, we got to talk about free people and free-born people, because black people think they're free. You're not. You were free up. A free-born person is someone who does not know what it's like to be a slave. They have no recollection, no experience of it whatsoever. A free person is always conscious somewhere in their mind that they are still under the control of another person. We are freed up. A free-born person does not think like a freed up person. Remember the 13 colonies declared independence from Britain. You did not declare independence, you were emancipated. Woo. The word emancipation does not mean freedom, it is a transfer of ownership. What they did was took away slavery from the master and gave it to the government. You're all state property. Bury the culture of the oppressor, freeborn people have their own. Free people are dependent on their oppressor, freeborn people have their own institutions. Free people tend to see their oppressor as somewhat of a misguided friend. Freeborn people see their oppressor as a total enemy. If we were not still the mental slaves of Europeans, 
we would not have to argue about whether or not we needed our own institutions. You see that? That's an argument free-born people don't have. Only free people have that argument. The fact you can go through what you went through and still think it's possible to coexist with the European clearly indicates you were freed by the European. Next slide. Now, eugenics. Let's talk about AIDS and HIV for a moment. Does HIV cause AIDS? Does AIDS and Ebola come from Africa? Do the AIDS medication work? And what about AIDS and natural resources? I want you to do some research. I want you to go and get a map of Africa that has the resources by country. And then I want to get you a map of AIDS rates in Africa. And I want you to put the map of the AIDS rates on Africa on top of the map with the resources, and you will see that AIDS follows the natural resources. Go and do the research. I've done it. That's right. They put the AIDS where they need to clean out the population to steal the resources. Let's talk about AIDS. Right now, the United States government argument is that AIDS was created by a monkey in the jungle of the Congo. And that the monkey in the Congo cohabitated with a black woman. And that's how you got AIDS. If anybody saw the movie Outbreak, the movie Outbreak deals with AIDS and Ebola. They say Ebola came from the monkey in the jungle as well. Now let me ask you a question. Why is it that they're saying AIDS came from a monkey in the Congo? Why not Ethiopia? Why not Nigeria? Why not South Africa? Why not Malawi? You want to know why? Because 80% of the world's coltan comes from the Congo. And for those of you who don't know what coltan is, it is a mineral combination of cobalt and titanium that is absolutely necessary for your cell phone. Absolutely necessary for your Xbox. Absolutely necessary for your laptop. Absolutely necessary for your camcorder. Absolutely necessary for your automobile. Absolutely necessary for your airplane. That means one nation in Africa, the Congo, if it ever got organized and was able to keep European interests from coming in to rape of the natural resources, they could cripple the American technological revolution last night. Woo! Gotcha. So my point is, brothers and sisters, and I want us to be clear, crystal clear, that AIDS was created by the United States government as a eugenic strategy to reduce the population of black people. When you go back to Jimmy Carter's administration, he had a program called Global 2000. The aim of Global 2000 was to reduce the population of blacks on the face of the earth by 50% by the year 2000. Now we're in 2010. They run in a little late, so they need to catch up, so they're coming up with all kinds of other stuff. Now, one thing you gotta know about AIDS, it originally was projected as a white homosexual male disease. Now it is the number one killer of black women. I want you to know that AIDS was already designed to be the number one killer of black women. It was never about gay white men. But whenever you want to fool a Negro, tell them that a certain, certain situation has nothing to do with them and then let it catch them by surprise. The first documented case of AIDS in the United States came in the 1970s. The same time homosexuality was taken out of the DSM as a sexual perversion and became a normal behavior. Is it a coincidence that the first cases of AIDS and the normalization of homosexuality took place the same year? Mm. No. They had to do what? Normalize homosexual behavior so it could be pushed in the public schools and they give the AIDS to the homosexual men and we give it to our sisters. Yeah. And that's how they exterminate the race. Talk to any medical doctor. The number one reason why black women are catching the AIDS is because they have a sex with, bi with bisexual black men. It's the government giving you AIDS. HIV does not cause AIDS. HIV has nothing to do with AIDS. That's right. Please understand that. You get AIDS from the government. Magic Johnson had HIV for damn near 20 years and ain't got AIDS yet. Because yeah. it has nothing to do with AIDS. And for people who have HIV, who get AIDS symptoms, you're getting symptoms because the medications that they're giving you are killing you, not the AIDS. The only thing that HIV has been proven to do is to wipe out maybe one out of every 10,000 helper cells in the body. <laughs> HIV does not cause AIDS. All right? 
Bill Gates is over in Africa. By the way, Bill Gates' father was a member of the American Eugenics Society. Bill Gates is a eugenicist. In fact, he was quoted a couple months ago, and I had it on my Facebook page, as stating that if we continue to do what we're doing in Africa, we should be able to reduce the population growth to about 10%. See? We still got this idea, and we have it in the black community too, that we can use the white man's money to fight the white man. It's impossible. You can't do it. It's not allowed. They take your 501c3, you're done. If you got a 501c3 tax exempt organization, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have it for certain purposes, but you cannot get involved in political work. Remember when the NAACP, and I'm no fan of them, when they went against George Bush, when Bush ran against Al Gore, what's the first thing that the Europeans did? They said, we got to review your tax exempt status. You're not supposed to get involved in political activism. You're giving free money. And what we have to realize, there's nothing free. When you take free money, it means that your tongue is no longer free. So either your tongue is going to be free, and your pocket is going to be full, or your pocket is going to be empty, and your tongue is going to be free. I prefer to have a free tongue. That's right. Next slide. Now, Obama. Where did he come from? About a year before he got elected, no Negro knew him except the ones in Chicago. He was junior senator for less than three years. What black man you know of gets pumped up to be president of a country when they haven't even had national experience more than one term? They chose Obama before you even knew who he was. Why did they choose Obama? Why did the Trilateral Commission and the Bilderberg Group and the Council on Foreign Relations, and by the way, Michelle Obama is a board of director for the Council on Foreign Relations. That's right, that's right. His wife is on the board of directors. And for those who don't know the CFR, the CFR was started in 1920, the same time that Marcus Garvey had his first international conference. African Peoples of the World, Madison Square Garden, New York City. And the reason the CFR was started was actually to stop Mr. Garvey's influence in Africa, believe it or not. Obama was chosen because America's reputation in third world nations was destabilized. And they needed somebody with tan skin to make the world believe that America had changed its ways. That's why Obama is in the White House to rebuild what George Bush destroyed. He is not in the White House for you, nor is he in the White House to mislead you. Some black people are running around saying what well, they gave him them, so we wouldn't know. They not think about you. You are already beat. You are freed. <laughs> no one's thinking about you. We don't even have sense enough to spend money with our own stars. Nobody's thinking about you. You're already done out. Obama is about international relations. To make a long story short, it has been proven over the last five years that the continent of Africa has about 85% of the untapped gas and oil on the face of the earth. They said Africa has more gas and oil than the Middle East. Obama's father was a Kenyan, so you're told. The birth certificate said he was Indonesian. I don't see how an African baby got mistook for an Indonesian. So that's something that needs to be investigated anyway. Whether his father really is black or not. Okay, because they make up all kinds of stuff. But anyway. Obama's job is to go into Africa using his black skin and genealogy to get Africa to open up their resources to the West. That's why AFRICOM is there. That's his mandate, to militarize Africa. So what's going to happen as soon as the African nations wake up and say, you know what, you're not going to pip our gas and our oil. If you want something, you're going to have to pay for it. You know what they're going to say? We found a terrorist in Nigeria. We found a terrorist in Ethiopia. We found, watch, you're going to start seeing the terrorists come out of Africa as soon as they stop giving up the oil. In fact, it happened last year. Remember the brother from Nigeria? He was the son of a king. Mm. And I go to Nigeria on the regular, and I can tell you Nigerians are not in love with Arabs like blacks in America. They don't do the Arab thing. On East Africa, they do the Arab thing. Nigerians do not do the Arab is my brother thing. So for them to show the king, the, 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 a prince, a son of a king, talking about he was working with Al-Qaeda to bomb somebody, that's a damn lie. The real reason they set him up like that is because his father is opposed to the continued rape of African resources by the IMF and World Bank. Now, Obama, Hurricane Katrina, 2005. Who was sent down there to shake hands with the victims? Bush? Clinton and Obama. Obama was in Russia. Clinton and Bush were made to wait until Obama came back to America before they could go and shake hands with the victims. You mean to tell me two presidents are being made to wait for a junior senator in the only black senatorial district in America? 
No, they chose him before you knew him. Right. Obama was a state senator being a keynote speaker at the 2004 Democratic National Convention. What is a state senator doing speaking at a Democratic National Convention? I bet you none of your state senators been invited to speak at the Democratic National Convention as the keynote speaker because they wanted to see the reaction to white folks. Whenever you put a black person in charge, it's always a delicate situation because white supremacy does not accept authority from black people. And one of the big mistakes we make in the black, in the black community is we think that white people will actually share power. White people do not share power. They don't share power if you go into business with them. They don't share power on the school board. They don't share power on a political level. There is no way you're ever going to get anywhere with some integrated struggle with the people who culturally are opposed to power sharing. Woo! But we continue to think that we can do. The European does not share power. Now, Reverend Jeremiah Wright didn't say anything wrong when he said Obama knew what it was like to grow up black. He simply told the truth. Why did Obama rebuke that man so quickly after he baptized his daughters and was the daughter's grand uh, godfather? Why? Because the only reason why Obama joined Trinity United Church in the first place was for votes. The same reason why any black politician joins a big mega church, for votes. But let me ask you a question. Did you know that President Obama was good friends with the choir director at Trinity United, who was a known homosexual? Woo! And that the choir director had his brains blown out before the Democratic National Convention. Yes, he did. Did you know that there was a second homosexual at Trinity United's Gospel Choir who Obama, it was alleged, also was kind of close with? His brains was blown out right after the Democratic National Convention. Did you know that there was a third homosexual at Trinity United Church who had his brains blown out after President Obama yeah. became president? All three of them homosexuals, all three of them were friends with President Obama. Did you know that there was a white man who wrote a book saying that he was President Obama's lover while he was junior senator in Illinois? And that he used to frequently have sex with President Obama in the back of his state limousine. And that this European was threatened by the CFR and Trilateral Commission that if that book got published, they would guarantee either the book lives or he lives. They made him pull the book. I believe they now own the rights and it will never ever get published. I'm not saying he's gay, but I'm saying there's a lot of evidence to support. <laughs> <laughs> now, then you gotta talk, well, well, we'll get to this in a minute. Because you gotta ask yourself, why is the director of safe and drug-free schools in America a known homosexual? And why is the Secretary of Education the same person who fought for an all-gay high school in Chicago? Why is Obama putting homosexuals in charge of your child's public education? Next slide. Wow, wow. Now, who controls your mind? One of the biggest reasons we can't get out of this situation is because of the misinformation. I want you to know that 99.9% .9 of everything you hear, everything you read, Everything you watch is controlled by one of these five European giants. That's from rap music to the Daily News, Time Warner, Disney, Bert Talsman, Viacom who bought BET from Bob Johnson for $2 billion a couple years ago, about 10 years ago. Do you know why Bob Johnson sold BET? Bob Johnson sold BET because he said that he could make more money and be a greater benefit to black people by opening up the world's first totally black-owned airline and travel agency. Because black people spend more money on travel than most other people put together as a percentage of the population. So when white folks found out that this Negro wanted to fly airplanes, they said somebody sent him a basketball because he ain't gonna own no planes. And that's how Bob Johnson went from trying to open up a black airline agency to be a majority owner of the Charlotte Bobcats. One thing we gotta understand about white supremacy, there's certain industries that you ain't allowed to be in. Michael Jordan is the first NBA player in history to be majority owner of an NBA team. Are you serious? And he had to buy the Bobcats from Bob Johnson because there's certain industries you ain't allowed to be in. You ain't allowed to float ships, you ain't allowed to fly planes. You ain't allowed to publicly trade on Wall Street unless you only have a certain number of stock. 
And that's why Oprah Winfrey, yeah, even as much as a house Negro she is, they finally just gave her own, her own station. And, and Bill Cosby was trying to get his station yeah, right, since right. the beginning of time. Yeah, Not right. to say he conscious, but if they won't get Bill Cosby's station, you can clearly see they understand the importance of controlling your misinformation. Did you know that the CIA and the FBI are two of the largest publishers of news magazines and professional journals? You mean to tell me when you go into the uh, supermarket and you pick up your favorite sports magazine, do you know that that could actually be owned by the CIA? You read the Daily News, it's actually owned by the FBI. They publish more than 200 of the journals that you read and you don't even know it. Wow. Freedom of information, that is the biggest lie ever told. Ain't nothing free. Ain't nothing free. Next slide. Look at that. Journals and newspapers, the CIA and the FBI, controlling what you read. America is all about social control. Why? Because it is a false democracy. It is an aristocracy. And because it is based on a lie, anything based on a lie has a shaky foundation. So you must always go out of your way to make sure that the people are blind to what's really going on. Black people are still fighting over why you didn't go out and vote for Obama. It didn't make yeah. a difference. The United States Constitution clearly tells you that the people do not choose the president. The Electoral College chooses the president, and the Electoral College is chosen by rich, white, property-owning men with power and privilege. And we've gotten away from that. Furthermore, the United States of America is not a democracy. The United States of America is a republic. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the what? for which it stands, not to the democracy. If America was a democracy, and a city like New York or Philadelphia, where black people are about half of the population, all y'all would have to do is pass a vote, and everything would be working to the best interest of black people. That's right. You follow me? So if it was a democracy, why don't you have what you're supposed to have, even though you dominated certain boroughs? Because it's not a democracy, it's a republic, which is the rule of law, mm. not the people. Next slide. Now, there's a lot of secret societies out there, but there's six that rule them all, and that's the Trilateral Commission. Who started the Trilateral Commission? Zbigniew Brzezinski in 1973, I believe the year was. Zbigniew Brzezinski was President Obama's undergraduate advisor. Zbigniew Brzezinski was on, what's the, uh, the, the uh, news show that comes on? America Today. One of, those ABC, one of those Saturday morning news specials of Big New Brzezinski when Obama was a junior senator in Chicago, he said that I think this man will be a good candidate for president of the United States. So Big New Brzezinski is the mastermind of the CFR and Trilateral Commission and he nurtured President Obama all the way through his college years. You have to understand that presidents are chosen at least four years in advance. They know right now whether they're going to give him the White House again. They know right now. And I don't wish harm on nobody, but he better be careful because these Europeans won't hesitate to kill him and say the Arabs did it so they can go over there and get some more resources. They tried to build the Bilderberg Group, which is the most powerful of them. Everybody belongs to the Bilderberg. That's your top entertainers, your top politicians, your top business owners. Bill Gates got invited to his very first Bilderberg meeting last year. And you see how long it took him to get in. So you got to understand what you're dealing with. The Order of London, that's where Cecil John Rhodes, he helped to start that. The uh, European who went into Africa killed over 50 million South Africans to control the diamonds. And let's talk about this blood diamond. Every damn diamond is a blood diamond. Do you understand? Every diamond is a blood diamond. They got you thinking, these are the good ones, these are the bad. You know what the good ones are? The good ones are actually the bad ones. The good ones are the ones that the Europeans gave you to sell. The bad diamonds are the good diamonds. Those are the ones that the brothers and sisters are trying to sneak out their damn self. You see that? Do you know that in Africa, if a native African gets caught with a diamond, they can be exterminated? That they have all types of militia men stationed in Sierra Leone, the Congo, South Africa, and everywhere there is diamonds? And if they even think that a black person is trying to smuggle a diamond out of Africa, they'll be exterminated? Do you know that there's so many diamonds under the soil of Africa that if you put diamonds on the international market all at one time, you would drop the price of a diamond to a nickel apiece? Wow. 
study the history of the Beers dominant power, you will find that the engagement ring as a diamond was a marketing strategy by the Bilderbergs. Yes, sister, study it. The diamond did not become a woman's best friend until they spent billions of dollars on millions of commercials marketing the diamond as the woman's best friend. And so for revolutionary sisters, you got to decide, do you want a stolen resource out of your mother continent for your husband to prove to you that he loves you? <laughs> skull and bones, you got to be from Yale to be a skull and bones. I was told by an elder of mine two weeks ago that the brother who owns Black Enterprise, what's his name? He's a Mega Sci Fi member. Earl Graves, I heard he's the first black skull and bone in history. I don't know if it's true, you gotta study it. I haven't confirmed it, but I was told that Earl Graves is the first black skull and bone in history. You're right, that's what I said, because you ain't allowed to be one if you ain't blue blood. You can't even be Jewish and be in skull and bones, I don't think. And then you got the North American Union, Mexico, America, and Canada. Okay, one world government. The new white order is just a new order for white supremacy. It's the same old thing in a new bag. Why should we be concerned about NWO? The reason you gotta be concerned with NWO because they wanna make white supremacy the permanent rule of law. One bank, one currency, one army, and one type of slave. So guess who's gonna be the peasant class in the new world order? Black people. The world is organized on a color hierarchy. White at the top, black at the bottom, brown and tan in the middle. And what makes us so sad is that we as Africans are the sleeping giants of the world because there's no country on earth that can exist without Africa, but Africa can exist without any other country. But the problem with Africa is the same problem with black America. The leadership is cowardly and self-serving. And until you deal with cowardly and self-serving leadership, you'll never get anywhere. Right. Fear and finance. Find a leader who ain't afraid of white folks and find a leader who can't be bought off. You got you a leader. It's hard to find him. You see what happened to Lumumba in the Congo? Sliced his body up into little teeny pieces and put it in acid and the only thing survived was his teeth. Because all he said, if you want it, you're going to have to pay for it. And Mobutu, who he brought in as an understudy, stabbed him in the damn back. Look at that, y'all. We got to study. Remember, there must be, listen to me now, there must be an internal revolution before there can be a political one. If we do not change the way we think, the way we talk, the way we feel about one another, right. then it ain't no need to fight the white man. That's right. Because you will become them incarnate after the victory. Look at Africa. Look at the heads of state. The president of Senegal has a white wife. He's not the only one. It's about 10 of them. What the hell are you doing as an African head of state with a European queen? What are you saying to all the black women in your own country? But then after all, most of the presidents were Western trained. And then after all, nearly every African constitution was written over here and shipped over the water. They are using European systems to run African people, and we wonder why we can't get out of slavery. Understand this, especially when they talk about black people being criminals and black men being born criminals. There can be no criminal if there's no criminal society to produce them. Do you understand that? Criminals are made. They are byproducts of the social order. Nobody's born a criminal. Anybody in here would become a criminal tomorrow if your ability to take care of yourself and your children was snatched. So we gotta stop looking at our brothers and sisters in the street saying, what's wrong with him? No, what the hell is wrong with us that we allow a situation like that to evolve? Mm. Next slide. There's no future without Africa. The reason why Africa is so backwards, good people, is because they are only used as a dollar store. The white countries go into Africa, get everything for a dollar, go back, refine it, and sell it for $1,000. When I was in Nigeria, you see Shell, Exxon, Mobil, all the gas companies, pump, pump, pump. Do you know why the brothers was bombing them? They don't tell you the whole story. The reason why the brothers was bombing the oil refineries is they said, how the hell do you want to come from Europe to my country, take my gas and oil, and I can't even have a job? They bring in white workers too. So the brothers 
just like I got a family I can't even feed, and you importing white workers? Oh, hell no. <laughs> no. If I can't eat, you can't eat. Booyah. And see, the problem with the revolutionary energy in Africa is they ain't got strong leadership. Because them brothers over there not afraid. They not afraid. They ain't suicide bombing, but they not afraid either. They will fight and die, but they ain't got strong leadership. It's totally reactionary. Every time you see something going on in Africa, ask yourself, why is it happening and who is paying for it? Again, follow the resources. Where is all the fighting? In the countries with the most resources, the Congo, Sierra Leone. You know what they do? They come in and they give weapons to this side. Then they send somebody else in and give weapons to this side. And they tell them, I need you to protect the resources and I'll cut a side deal. And they tell them, I need you to protect the resources and they cut a side deal. So no matter who wins, they get all the resources. Do you know that 85% of the guns that's used in Africa is coming from China or the United States? How they get it? They ain't got no license to carry like you. World Bank, International Monetary Fund. The reason why Africa is so backwards is because at the end of the revolutionary struggle, when they killed off Amakal Cabral, and when they killed off Patrice Lumumba, when they killed off Steve Biko, when they killed off the true revolutionary leaders, they sat down with the black bourgeoisie and signed the deal. It wasn't the revolutionaries who signed those deals. It was the bourgeoisie who was put in place after they killed off the revolutionaries. Right. And they signed contracts that said, we're going to help you rebuild your infrastructure, but the interest is going to be a thousand to one. Oh, so for every dollar you get, you owe us a thousand dollars. So Africa is in debt more now than it was before freedom came. Because they signed debts that said, that in order for me to get any money, I gotta open up my country to free market so white people can sell anything in Africa they want and destroy the economy. Africa is kept back. Africa is not a developing nation. It is an oppressed continent. Next slide. Now, extermination of black boys. Five stages. Every black man in America is expected to go through these stages. And we got to fight like hell to keep ourselves and our sons out of it. Number one is miseducation, which has three goals. What are the goals of miseducation for black children or boys in particular? Number one, to hate self. Number two, to love white people. And number three, to become effeminate. Mm. To hate self, to love white people, and to become effeminate. Mm. Homosexualization and effeminization are being pushed in the public schools by your new secretary of education as a birth control strategy. Make them gay, give it AIDS, they give the AIDS to their women. HIV is the number one killer of black women on the face of the earth. Then they want to give him drugs. He got ADHD, he got conduct disorder, he got oppositional defiant disorder, he got anti-social anti personality disorder, he got disruptive behavior disorder, and give him pills, it's all baloney. 75% of black boys diagnosed with a disruptive behavior disorder do not have a father figure in their life. This ain't a psychiatric problem, it's a broken black family problem. But white people can't make billions of dollars off of broken black family problems. But once you medicalize it, now you can treat it. And that's why I want you to see how they like to medicalize it. Because when you medicalize it, you say only a medical doctor can fix it. And only a drug company can get rich off of it. Y'all have to understand this. Stop letting people medicalize social problems. They're not psychiatric problems. I can't sit still long enough to be miseducated, so I'm ADHD. My teacher disrespects me, I disrespect her back, so now I got conduct disorder. You teaching me that Christopher Columbus was somebody great, and Barack Obama is somebody I should look up to, and I know better than that, so now I'm oppositional defiant disorder. The school police officer puts his hands on me. I put my hands on him back. I disrupt the behavior disorder. Mm. Do you know what those disorders are? Those are diagnoses given to black boys who refuse to have their spirit broken. That's right. That's right. Show me a homosexual boy diagnosed with conduct disorder. It don't exist. Show me a homosexual boy diagnosed with oppositional defiant. It don't exist. Those diagnoses are diagnoses of a black spirit that will not be crushed. The problem is, when our sons come home and say, Mom, Dad, something is wrong with that schoolhouse, we send them right back to
to it and don't even advocate for our boys. That's right. So the That's teacher right. don't help them. The parents don't help them. Don't you know that it is natural for a child not to want to go somewhere where they are mistreated and made to feel like less than a human being? So why the hell are we surprised that the dropout rate in New York City and Philadelphia is so damn high? He's not going to protect his self-image, and I don't blame him. There's no such thing as a black dropout rate. There is only a black push-out rate. Our kids are pushed the hell out of school. That's right. 93% of all teachers in America are white women. Why in the hell are you expecting a white woman to teach a black boy? Mm. If a white person believes that the black child is inferior, how the hell are they going to teach them? That's wow, right. that's deep. Yeah. It's a lot of sense. The research tells us that teachers pay the most attention to children in the classroom who look like they own kids at home. So if your son got broad nose, big lips, snappy hair, and he got a white teacher, you shouldn't be surprised to come in there like many of my parents and the child is sitting at a desk and the desk is facing the damn wall but the teacher teacher back here. <clears throat> parents can change this though, y'all. We gotta get active, y'all not active. Right. We lazy and apathetic and we let them mistreat our sons and I don't like it. After the drugs, Ritalin, Stratera, Prozac, Cyclerp, Adderall, Depakote. Did you know that the same company that makes Depakote makes Isomil baby formula? They give you your baby psychotropic drugs as an infant. That's right. And you wonder why they cry. You see the mothers, every time I give him the breast milk, he don't want it. He keep wanting the white man's milk. I want the white man's milk, mommy. The white man's milk. Because he got chemicals in it to make the baby cry. The baby addicted to baby crack. Liquid version. That's right. Liquid version. Sisters, you got to get a baby to breast. That's right. Even if for a little while, please give him the breast. Give a white man's milk and he just came out your womb, he already hooked up on the system. Look, he on the system already. And then they just recalled the milk. What, last week? They said that it was uh, insect particles in the milk. Yeah. Okay? Wow. Then the brother goes to jail, frustration, irritation, hopelessness, and then they kill him. Or we kill each other because of the stress. Please don't underestimate the impact that stress has on the homicide rate. Don't underestimate the impact that depression has on the homicide rate. I had a Jewish professor told me that he thinks 25% of the black male homicide rate can be directly attributed to side effects of psychotropic drugs. Wow. Do you know that psychotropic drugs cause homicidal ideation? and suicidal ideation. If you don't believe me, go to the Scientology when the white folks is fighting like crazy. But we not fighting. We not fighting. We giving our kids these pills. Nobody's telling you that Ritalin is pharmacologically the same thing as street speed. Speed and Ritalin are the same drug. So you need to tell me I can prescribe this to a five-year-old boy, nobody gets in trouble, but if my son sells it on the corner, he goes to jail for 10 years, something ain't right. Let this settle me. The Drug Enforcement Agency of America classifies Ritalin as a Schedule B drug. That means it's one of the most addictive substances you can take. And that's the DEA, not me. And you know that all drugs are metastasized in the kidney and the liver, so when you get a black boy Ritalin for 20 years, next thing you know he's on dialysis. You killed him because he couldn't sit still long enough to be what? Miseducated and effeminized. Next slide. Now, black male oppression, almost totally institutional and is intentionally designed through white institutions. It cannot be destroyed by teaching our males to be better citizens, and it is an outgrowth of the black community's failure to provide for us home. Let's talk about that second argument. Negroes are quick to say, it is bad decisions, Umar. It ain't the white man, it's bad decisions. I said bad decisions can't possibly result in only one out of every four black men getting a high school diploma. Bad decisions can possibly result in black people being four times the prison rate than they are in the population in every state in this country. That ain't bad decisions. That is a systematic attempt. We have to understand that crime is a function of focus and intent. When you want to lock the people up, you target them. We got people got us thinking that the reason why it's more black men in jail is because they just happen to be caught doing something wrong. 
If I wanted to turn the jails white tomorrow, you know what I need to do? Make drunk driving a federal offense 10 years in jail automatic. That's right. You will see the jails become white overnight because drunk driving is predominantly a white middle class problem. Do you feel me? Yes. But you'll never see drunk driving carry a mandatory minimum sentence because it's white. But crack does because it's black. Wait a minute, you mean to tell me I get caught with five ounces, I go to jail for 10 years, but he need 500 ounces of power? And you heard what happened last month, right? Congress modified the law. It's no longer a 1 to 100 disparity. Now it's like a uh, 15 to 100 disparity. And black people running around celebrating. Hold, hold tight. You mean to tell me they're still going to put more brothers in jail for crack than they do whites for power, but because it's one or two brothers less, we celebrate. Next slide. Miseducation. Negative self-image and feminization, special ed, academic neglect. Our children are intentionally miseducated so they cannot compete with white children for the same jobs. Right. Right. Next slide. Perpetuate myths of negative black manhood and replace it with an excess of positive images of black female heroes. Now, what they're doing now is in addition to black female heroes and white heroes, you're now going to see a lot of black male homosexual heroes being taught in a public school. See, the homosexual movement has hijacked the civil rights movement, if you ain't been paying attention. Yes, there is no more civil rights for black people. There's only civil rights for three groups, illegal immigrants, Hispanics, and gays. You notice that? Yeah. That's all Obama cares about. If you ain't gay, Hispanic, yeah, or an illegal immigrant, he don't know you. Exactly. That's, right. That's right. There is no more civil rights for black folks. Everything is homosexual. And then they try to say, well, Baynard Rustin was gay, A. Philip Randolph was gay, so the hell what? <laughs> that ain't what we about as a people. And I'm not saying we should go out beating up black homosexuals. I'm not into that. Not into it. Because a lot of those brothers and sisters can be brought back if they are brought into the correct knowledge of themselves. Right. Okay, so we don't need to kill them and harass them. I'm not into that. Furthermore, the reason why we got so many gay and lesbian children is because there is an issue in the black community that's not being talked about, and it's called incest that's right. and rape. That's right. Every homosexual boy that I've ever done therapy with, most of them, about 95% were molested before the age of 10 by an older male relative. And there is something about the first sexual act of a child, something about the first sexual act of a child that if it's with someone of the like gender, they will continue to crave it even though they hate it. And that's why black homosexuals have the highest suicide rate in America. Wow. That's right. So you have to be careful. You gotta be careful. You don't go around bashing. I believe in human rights for everybody. That's I right. don't believe in family rights. You're damn sure ain't getting married in my hood. But you got a right to eat, go to the job, and be safe, and not have to worry about anybody bothering you. But I don't believe in homosexual rights. As African people, the only marriage we've ever recognized is that between a man and a woman. Now, we understand that Europeans got a different thing. Okay? We also understand that when you look at the Greek and Roman gods, most of them was homosexual. See, when y'all look at those pictures of Zeus and Apollo, and y'all see all those little baby angels, y'all thought that those was angels. That ain't nothing but the little uh, boy pedophile that they would have sex with. That's right. That's right. That's right. And it wasn't until the Renaissance that they gave them wings. Because before then, they didn't have wings. Those are the sexual consorts of the guy. And when you study the stories of Zeus and Apollo, you will read how much they loved having sex with little boys. Not just men, but babies. And these were the gods. Mm. <laughs> and I showed you one at first, because some of y'all prayed to him. That's right. And you wonder why your prayers don't get answered and you're praying to the God of white supremacy. If white people are racist, why in the hell would they God serve you? That's right. It don't make any sense. Next slide. A feminization and homosexualization, don't confuse them. They're different. Related. You can be effeminate and not be gay. You can be gay and be very masculine. Some of the brothers in the prison, when I go and speak, they masculine as hell and stone homosexual, some of them. Okay? 
But the, the job of the public school is to break the spirit of the black boy. That's why if you have a son in public school, if they're about to break his spirit, you got to put him in another institution. Because once the spirit is broke, it is hard to fix it. Amen. Frederick Douglass said it best. My ancestor, when he said it, it's better to raise strong men or raise healthy men than to repair broken adults. Don't let them break the boy's spirit. But if most teachers are female, white female, they want the boy to act like a white girl in the class. And when he don't act like a white girl, he's been kicked out, suspended, expelled, put on drugs. And there's even talk that they're putting estrogen in the drugs to feminize the boys even more. Yes, yes. And also, you need to know that the drugs kill the heart, the, the, the kidney, liver, kill brain cells, and it also messes with the black male's ability to produce healthy semen in his testicles. That's right. So you're giving your son these drugs 20 years from now, he won't be able to have children. Next slide. Damn. Now, real quick, how did homosexual come to be so popular? According to the most generous of estimates, homosexuals are about 10% of the American population. So how are they dictating policy? In 1972, the Rockefeller World Population Council, Planned Parenthood International, the same Planned Parenthood that gives you the abortions. And by the way, the reason why so-called Hispanics ain't nothing but black folks anyway, the reason why they're passing you in terms of population numbers is because you get more abortions than them. Hispanics don't kill their children as much as black people do. We've killed more than three million of our children through abortion in the past 25 years. Three million. Self-hate. The Rockefellers Planned Parenthood decided that homosexuality should no longer be considered deviant. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the little great book, The Bible of Psychology, used to have homosexual behavior as a deviancy. Up until 1972, that means homosexuality only been normal for 38 years in this country. What made it normal? It was made normal by the American Psychiatric Association in 1973 at their convention in California, homosexuals snuck in and they worked with homosexuals inside of the APA and they stole the mailing list of the membership and they sent letters to every psychiatrist in America asking them to vote to take homosexuality out of the book. Wow. Homosexuality was taken out of the book so that it could be pushed in the black community as a form of birth control. We know that because in 1974, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger published his famous National Security Memorandum, which was totally about birth control, excuse me, population control. Henry Kissinger's report was totally about population control. And in that report, he also mentioned that birth control, he also talked about stuff like contaminating the water supply, okay? And he also hinted that homosexuality should also be openly advocated in the black community to reduce our numbers. Make the men gay, give them AIDS, they give it to their women. Next slide. That is your Secretary of uh, Education. Arnie Duncan, good friend of Obama, he was a Chicago educator, and this is the man who fought for an all-gay high school in Chicago. The bill was ultimately killed, but Obama rewarded him for fighting for the gay school, and gay made him Secretary of Education. Next slide. This is Kevin Jennings. He is the director of Safe Schools and Drug-Free Schools. Safe for homosexuals, by the way. Safe for homosexuals, okay? Safe and drug-free schools. And this man wants a mandatory kindergarten through 12th grade homosexual curriculum in every public school in America. Did you hear what I just told you? Yeah. He wants a mandatory K-12 homosexual curriculum in every public school in America. Damn. Why are the two most powerful people in public education both gay? Mm. That's a question for your president. Furthermore, did you know that President Obama has made history? He has appointed more homosexuals to the federal office than any president in history, and more than Bush and Clinton put together in all 16 years. Wow. Obama been in office how long? Three, maybe? Two? He's appointed more homosexuals than Bush and Clinton combined in 16 years! Because his domestic agenda is to effeminize the entire black population. Remember, psychotropic drugs are given for social control. Psychotropic drugs are the new COINTELPRO. The pill has become the new father in the black community. 
When you were going to school, if you misbehaved, they would call your dad. Exactly. Today, when you misbehave, they call your psychiatrist. It is daddy in a bottle. Next slide. This is a book you might want to investigate. American Psychiatry and Homosexuality. This book gives you the definitive history of how homosexuals infiltrated the American Psychiatric Association and had it voted off the list of sexual deviant behaviors. This is not a joke. It was done in the 70s. It ain't even been that long. How is it that homosexuality is so powerful and has only been safe for 38 years? Because they have powerful people in high places who are funding them for agendas that are different than what the homosexuals really think is for. They're funding them to change the way you think of the age. Homosexuality is nothing new in European culture. It's always been. In, in fact, if you study European psychology, Freud, Erickson, Adler, Jung, all of them said that Homer King James, Napoleon, Caesar, they was all gay. But the point is, white psychologists believe that homosexual behavior is a natural part of adolescent male behavior. Every last one. That's why when your son is questioning his identity, the worst thing you can do is send him to a, a white psych. Because they're going to encourage the behavior. They're going to propagate and brainwash that child after the first session, he's going to come out flu. And you will wonder what the hell is going on. And that's why before you send your child to a psychiatrist, go online. There's an uh, organization, the National Association of Gay and Lesbian Psychotherapists. You want to type the name in and see if they're gay, because they're not going to tell you. The homosexual movement is undercover, and they draft the black people more than the army. Next slide. Hijacking the civil rights movement. Planned Parenthood also was a mandatory gay curriculum. Education about homosexuality will soon be taught. Homosexual rights has replaced black rights. Homosexual education is being pushed as a strategy to promote tolerance, which is really about black population control. Please don't fall for the argument. You black people was discriminated against because of your color. We being discriminated against because of our sexuality. What I came out of my mother ass ain't got a damn thing to do with who you choose to have sex with. We have to stop letting people confuse that. There is no proof on earth that homosexuals are born. In fact, the American Psychological Association just revised their official statement on homosexuality. And guess what? They backtracked. And now they're saying it's no conclusive evidence that homosexuality is innate. Homosexuality arises from a black boy who has been deprived of the love of his father. And because he still desires the intimacy with a male, he meets an adult male who becomes the father figure and manipulates the relationship to a homosexual one. Wow. Homosexuality is an intense form of intimacy with the father figure you never had. Lesbianism is an intense intimacy with the mother you never had. Many of our sisters are becoming gay out of hatred for black men. Out of hatred for black men. My father whipped my mother. My father didn't take care of us. My father was a no good this. He was a no good that. He molested me. I hate men so damn much that I don't even want to spend my life with one. I'd rather spend my life with a woman. Yes. There's reasons. It ain't natural. It's psychological disturbance. Next slide. We're going to take a 10 minute break right here. Good. Let's give it up, folks. I told you the brothers are coming powerful, y'all. How many of y'all would like to see the brother come back sometime? But you got to do something for me now. Each and every one of you, you got to at least bring two more people with you, or three more people with you, because this place should have been jam packed with the youth. They need to hear this. Right or wrong? All right, so we're going to take a quick 15, 10 minute break. Make sure you support the brother. He got his DVDs right here. He got his CDs. We got, they all five dollars. We got Dr. Jack right in the back. All right, so come on over here and support this brother right here. He got CDs and DVDs for five dollars. <laughs> over here, here. The colors are video and the white are audio. 
And on the audio, some of them are MP3 because they're like two and a half yes. hours. Yes, you can order things from them. So if you ain't got MP3 in your car, you might got to listen to them. I don't have time. any money. No. You get cards and everything on the table. Okay. Just go up and get a card. All right. Yes. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. I, I, I'm enjoying it. Please make sure you get this, right? You're going to definitely have this, right? Uh huh. Because you know what? A lot of stuff he's telling me, saying, I've told my daughter, and she doesn't listen to me, right? Quite frankly, like, this is my daughter. The grandchildren. Yeah, we're trying to keep my daughter's mind. What you, excuse me. What you think, man? Huh? Uh, hold on. Hold on. Damn.